Alan Coop. I'm the group leader for instrumentation at the Genome Sciences Center. I'm a professional engineer. I have a doctorate in physics. Uh, this is a strange journey, and I've actually, uh, I'm going to have a little bit of context here to give you some idea of where I come from in terms of prototyping and, and, and what we're doing, because uh, most people say, how did you get this job and other things like that? So um, essentially, uh, this is our outline, by the way. So I'm going to talk a little bit about my ascent situation, as I said, and, and then maybe like some stuff about prototyping. Like why do we prototype or what are your objectives for prototyping and then some and then this long spiel about some design principles that are pretty much mech but i think they're quite interesting because they, they, um, they're mathematically interesting at a deeper level like i'm going to talk about tonight and they there are things that i think about when i do mechanical stuff and, and this would this would be also you know sort of civil things as well uh that they're, they're structural things that they're very important um and then finally some more details about how to actually make stuff although i've realized i've, I've uh, Got some high-level principles and not, uh, you know, so diving as much into the details of things like fasteners that I do enjoy doing as well. So even though this talk is going to go over an hour, it won't uh, touch on everything. So our group, we build cool stuff and then people take nice photographs of them. Um, I work at the Genome Sciences Center, which is here uh, at Oak and just east of, uh, sorry, just east of Canby at Seventh Avenue. But we are around the Vancouver General Hospital complex. Uh, which includes a number of research facilities, the Cancer Research Center, Orthopedic Spinal Cord Research, BC Center for Disease Control, very exciting if you enjoy laboratory automation for COVID testing right now, uh, and then BC Cancer, main hospital here, uh, hopefully you can see my mouse wiggling around on my screen, uh, where our fancy machine shop is, I'll talk about. So there are many opportunities here to discover, oppor to discover uh, problems and think about solutions or find people who think they have solutions to problems and these are often very mysterious problems because the people who have the problems are highly specialized people in oncology or medical physics or orthopedic trauma. So it's a very exciting place to hang around and, and think about problems. Sorry, I'm looking over here because that's where you guys are, but I know you're actually over here. So I'll try and look over here instead. Um, so uh, yes, this is, and this is a great thing that we, you, as an engineer, this is one important uh, uh, major observation of a career that you, you want to be where you're discovering what the problems are, what, what the unarticulated things that will result in opportunities uh, can be in, in different industries. And so networking with people and questioning things and discovering things is a really important part of being an innovative uh, engineer or an innovative any person. Uh, and so, so this is something I highly encourage. Um, what window, oh, that window. Okay, sorry, things are appearing on my screen that it shouldn't. Uh, so our goal, yeah, of course, we build the world's best automation infrastructure for high throughput genomic sample preparation. Um, maybe we lead, we like, we want to. We we do want to lead and bring new methods of molecular biology, to particularly to high throughput, and that's resulted in some types of innovation. Uh, I'll talk about one example tonight. Um, and then, as I said just in the previous slide, leveraging our physical proximity to our clinical colleagues and our sort of clinical research colleagues to un uh, to uncover new opportunities in in the life science area, uh, in particularly in our case. Um, so a couple of major highlights, uh, DNA slice selection, this goes back about 10 years now, uh, realization that we needed a method by using, uh, to use in an automated way, separate DNA with gel, which is a kind of normal technique that everybody does in undergrad biology, but then use some robotics and cameras and some intelligence to identify target sizes of DNA and uh, pull those out using automated pipetting tools. And so we built a series of robots called Barracuda, Barracuda 1 and Barracuda 2. And there's this lovely prototype on the lower right that you can see, um, kind, of, uh, kind of intimidating to think about commercializing that for a, a relatively niche application. This was used for uh, thousands and thousands of samples for a huge project initially called the Cancer Genome Atlas uh, Project. But innovation uh, must not be stopped. And so it dawned on us there were simpler ways to do this. Uh, or, or rather ways that were more commercially practical. And this led to the uh, spin-off of um, Coastal Genomics, which is a, sorry, which is a company uh, that my, uh, my chief engineer at the time, Jared, uh, formed with a guy named uh, Matt Nesbitt, as the, who's actually the president. And uh, they basically took our core technology and, and uh, turned it into a, a system that could be run on a conventional liquid handling robot, a particularly robot from uh, Hamilton, uh, which is a, a big industry player. Um, and so if, essentially what you see in this photo on the left is uh, uh, lights for, this is actually a two color system for illuminating just different fluorescent dyes in the gel. And then there's a camera up in the middle here that takes pictures 
and, and all of these little trays along the sides are the actual gels where the DNA is running and then gets size separated and then gets selected out. And there's various source and uh, retrieval trays and pipette tips in the middle here. Uh, and so this, this thing is much faster than the original Barracuda. They then built a smaller version of it that's uh, semi-automated called the Light Bench, and so they're selling those as well. And then lo and behold, the, the company of which I was on the board of directors um, got sold this summer for, uh, if all goes well, a total of maybe $17.9 million Canadian, but of course that's based on some burnouts and whatnot. Uh, anyway, this is very, very uh, satisfactory and exciting for us to, uh, to reach this end point. And so the whole staff is still there, uh, still in Burnaby and, and Nanaimo, uh, and uh, still working on other projects with this company, Your Gene, that bought them. And so that's been really cool for us. Another big project that also goes back about 10 years um, uh, was a, uh, a contact I made, and this was because of particular funding opportunities we had to go out and find clinicians with unsolved problems and solve them. And I, if you guys were uh, funding agency people, I would, I would plea for more of the funding that led to this type of work. Because both this project and the previous project I talked about, uh, and a couple of other uh, important projects with a total investment of about $40 million came from the same $200,000 seed funding that, that was pretty wild. So this one was, a, it was Dr. Robert Meek, retired, a then newly retired orthopedic trauma surgeon from Vancouver General Hospital. And he had this problem of how do I make this curved, flexible intramedullary nail that goes inside bones and then what are not bones but specifically the pelvis because the pelvis of course has curves and you want to get a curved screw into the pelvis uh, and then make it rigid once it's in place and this would provide better pelvic fixation for broken pelvis that happens from car accidents and so forth. Uh, what we see on the left here is this guide wire that got inserted. It's inserted. This is a spring stainless steel wire and then we ream and, and then we had this early version of our implant where we had a cable inside and we tightened it and all the parts kind of friction fit together. Didn't work perfectly, but lots of things happened. Lots of money was raised, lots of fun was had. And now we have the Curafix intramedullary rod screw. Again, much of the early prototyping was, uh, prototyping for this was done in my, uh, uh, in our shop at BC Cancer. Um, and, and these sort of based on some intellectual property that, that, that I was involved in. And then uh, other people came along and, uh, as Curvafix got started. This has all been funded out of Seattle, um, originally with uh, a company called Intellectual Ventures. Uh, it's a long and amusing financial story. Uh, we leveraged quite a bit of uh, co-funding for local government grants, uh, and eventually it turned into the actual spin-off Curvafix. And Curvafix this summer also raised $10.75 million US uh, to continue our march to commercialization. Uh, this device here achieved, uh, if you follow these medical device things, this. This got FDA 510K approval, uh, which means as a, a, a similar to predicate devices, it's approved for use. We're now demonstrating its safety and efficacy and, and effectiveness and all that. So uh, this is another exciting project. I'm not so directly involved in this, but I advise on some of their uh, mechanical design issues at times and generally uh, go to attend meetings and learn a lot about how to commercialize medical devices. All right. Another current project, just, just for your sort of idea of perspective on the, the scale or the scope of what we can do here. Uh, this is a, a breast cancer therapy project that's also attempting to be commercialized involving uh, positioning the breast for improved radiation therapy. So this is from a mechanical point of view. This goes from uh, machining lots of little pieces of stainless steel to doing carbon fiber layups uh, of various sorts. Uh, and so there's lots of different kind of core competencies that we've had to develop for these things. Where do we do all this? In terms of proto physical prototyping, we have this amazing machine shop called the BC Cancer Joint Engineering Center, uh, which really is just the machine shop that was at BC Cancer that, that, that's in the medical physics department. And this was kind of a historical thing where in Canadian medical physics, uh, making radiation was actually a thing that Canada pioneered. And, and this meant that a lot of big hospitals ended up with machine shops as we were kind of, in the old days, like two generations ago, making, figuring out how to make radiation properly and aim it approximately in the right direction. It's become more of a biophysics problem. So the machine shops have been less utilized, but we were able to kind of re-invigorate uh, um, this one with new equipment and new people uh, over the last 15 years and, and done lots of cool things. So this is a machine we got a couple of years ago that we're very pleased with. Um, we, uh, that, that we can do a lot of, you know, it's a CNC mill, we can do a lot of prototyping with. So I just have it because it looks pretty. The, the machine shop though is very capable. I'm gonna talk about some of these capabilities. I know various of you are probably in, in chemical engineering or mech uh, and, and electrical maybe, and all of these shops in principle have these capabilities. The extent to which students have access to them varies. 
uh, but these are useful principles to know about because you can get stuff made these ways. So, so we have water jet cutting and sheet metal forming, and I'll talk about that. We have uh, the CNC mill and lathe and so forth. We have uh, welding, uh, including laser welding. You can see my son on the left there uh, as a kid when he was younger, uh, laser welding some stuff. Um, we can also do some, I'll actually talk about uh, one of our pipelines or what we do is sheet metal and then some 3D printing, uh, a sort of workhorse 3D printing instrument, but, but there are other ones around that are easy to access and, and some other capabilities. So when we do prototyping, so we have the ability to make things, but, but why are we doing it and what are we doing? So people talk about proof of concept, they talk about mock-up, they talk about prototype. I found where people actually, those things mean different things for different people. Um, and and there, can, there can actually be confusion when you talk about that because uh, uh, I, I think when we say prototype, we usually mean in engineering, we usually mean in the end some physical uh, object that looks like the real thing. Whereas a proof of concept kind of looks at maybe the underlying physics of the thing that we're attempting to prove and, and doesn't necessarily look like the, the finished commercial product, whatever that means. Um, and so the prototype, it, by my definition of being the physical thing, generally needs to look like something real. Like you can imagine that you went and bought it and you have it and it works in some reasonably simple way uh, and it doesn't look like it was cobbled together on a workbench, which I would describe as being a proof of concept. Um, generally speaking, uh, even if you're doing an early proof of concept, a kind of like, even like a sort of scientific experiment apparatus, or you're doing a real prototype, you really want, uh, good quality, good, good, good finish quality, and I'll talk about that more, but also uh, you want to do it quickly. And you want to do it quickly because you probably want to iterate it and do it several times uh, before you actually get the actual thing you want. And so this is, this is why prototyping quickly is important. We, fortunately, we have locally a philosopher of prototyping, uh, or as I would describe him. Uh, this is Dan Gelbart, and, and he is the co-founder of numerous companies. Creo got sold to Kodak 20 years ago for a billion dollars. Uh, Cardium, Icomed, Rapidity is a new metal 3D printing company. Uh, they have um, they have some cool technology actually for sure, and uh, they have placed some instruments at UBC, including one in Mech that may get running eventually, uh, and then one at Hatch, I believe. Um, he has just to give you an idea of the influence uh, of why these ideas are important, and many other people at UBC kind of have been influenced by him. He's caused eight water jet machines to be acquired by BC Teaching and Research Institute, so he's kind of a big deal. Um, his view, his, his principles is articulated many times over many years. Uh, more innovation, one, more innovation occurs when engineers and designers can make things themselves, i.e. engineers should have access to the machine shop. There's several reasons for this. Uh, often it's faster to iterate. Sometimes a complicated part engineer doesn't know how to make, that's not true. But, but quite often when you're also thinking about the part while you're making it, you're also concentrating on the design and that's when a lot of innovation happens. Uh, it also means you can change the design on the fly while you're building it because you know the whole story of the design whereas the uh if you give the design to a machine shop they don't actually know what's important and what's changeable and what really needs to be just the way the drawing said um you can it's it's always better to be able to iterate parts quickly to make designs and put them together and see if they work and change them if they don't um and a big thing for the the sort of industries he's been in and the industries i've been in which is that in these smaller industries where you're selling niche products the design is a big proportion of the cost uh, of the manufacturing. And so you, you have to be able to scale up from your prototype design to sort of early manufacturing um, without having to change the design very much. We're not talking about building cars here. We're talking about building, you know, scientific instruments or things like this, his, their industrial 3D printer, uh, where you go from the first one to the first 50 and they need to be pretty similar. Um, so you need to know how to be able to design, you need to know how to design things ideally that, that, that can have that happen to them where they can be scaled up. Um, prototypes almost always need to be well finished to be convincing. And this is why he was a big fan of proper finishing with things like powder coating. Good ones, and I've seen this, I have direct experience of this. Good prototypes make people think a thing is real. And when they think it's real, they will give you money. I am not lying. It's, it, it's, it's like the biggest deal. All right, so what are methods? This is, by the way, this talk has been, this is the first time this version of a talk has been given. So there's some skipping back and forth between making things and design as a separate concept. So bear with me. Um, so just to keep in mind, milling, what are, how we make things? Well, in small quantities, we make things by traditional machining, milling and turning, which could be manual or CNC machining. We can do 2D cutting. I think this is really important. I'm going to talk about a bit more laser cutting, water jet cutting, plasma cutting. We can do 3D printing. I think 3D printing is very useful, but it's probably also overhyped because it's very hyped. 
um, welding and, and, and the larger thing of welding structures together, which is generally referred to as fabricating as opposed to machining, is also important in, in certain contexts. Um, and then you have molding, injection molding, large scale molding, how kayaks are made, how small plastic parts are made, uh, composite layups, uh, other types of machining that, that, that uh, can be done as well. Um, you need to, when you think about prototyping, when you think about the design, of course, you have to think about what you have access to and whether you need to iterate the design or whether you can make nicer drawings and send them out to uh, a shop to get made with people that have skills you don't have. And, and so these are considerations. Um, prototyping considerations broadly though, um, what do you want the prototype to show? Uh, and, and this is a big thing. I, I tell this story when the iPhone was, was getting going, at some point they had prototypes of the iPhone software which was like an Apple G3 showing the iPhone software on a monitor. And then they have like a piece of wood with the hand painted icons of the phone, like looking like that, right? Which do you think in a way is more convincing? The software on a, on a G3 or the piece of wood that's painted to look like the iPhone? I think there, you, you know, if you think about it, this is very important to, to sort of have an idea of where this is going. And, and so, you know, this is a matter of judgment, but you want to show people what you want people to understand what you're trying to tell them. And you definitely don't want them to get the wrong idea of what they of what you're trying to show them and misinterpret your prototype. And I, I have stories I can go on all night about where that's happened. Uh, and generally, then we keep coming back to this thing of, of making the prototype kind of as finished as possible is nice. Um, then there's other questions, you know, how is it important to use the real materials? This is again a big where 3D printing often falls down that it's not really the right material, doesn't look right, doesn't have the right properties, it's not sterilizable for medical or whatever. Um, a lot of other things like lead times, cost, access to tools that you have, these have to be important considerations when you're, when you're you know, in grad school, where you're an undergrad project, you need to do something in a certain time frame. But when you're actually really commercializing something, this is a, and the fish there is actually a red herring, right? You guys know what a red herring is? It's a thing that will mislead you, but it's not important. It is, uh, the reason is that when you're commercializing something, you know, this is like a children's fantasy novel where you've got to take the ring to Mordor and you are going to have to some, solve some of the problems between here and Mordor. And all of those things, lead times, cost, access to tools, if you're going to commercialize something, you are going to have to solve them. So you can't get hung up on these things or you have to find a way around them. Um, as I say, though, when you're doing, you're building, you know, apparatus for your research project as an undergrad or graduate student, that's a bit different. All right, we're going to dive into design here for a little bit, and uh, and I'm glad this is being recorded because because at least you will be able to go and find the references and and think about this more carefully. Uh, I think this is rather quick. This was originally aimed at second year students uh, for the engineering physics two five three course, um, and I've tried to simplify it a lot, but I uh, I think that there's probably still rather too much. Uh, here, but we'll, we'll give it a try. So design. Design is like, honestly, I've been doing this now seriously for, well, if you count since undergrad, 30 years, and it's so much fun to be able to have a job where you get to actually design stuff. It's incredibly important for, you know, in the history of our civilization, gaining mastery of new materials to make new things. I've got here the Stone Age, the Bronze Age, and the Iron Age, if you could interpret that correctly. And, and you know, this, it, these different materials enable new devices and we're able to exploit these innovations to come up with new things. And this is what, in a technological sense, allows a civilization to move forward. It's incredibly exciting. Um, when we teach you as engineers, what are we trying to do? Really, what I think they're trying to do is you want to teach all these principles that you have to learn in class, physics, math, chemistry, um, you know, engineering, which is some way that those three things are applied. Um, you, you then do projects and you have co-op jobs and these teach you skills like, like learning CAD, learning programming, learning circuit design, learning firmware programming, um, you know, other machine shop type skills. You get better at it. And then at some point, those skills that are in your hands and the theory that is in your brain get connected together in this wonderful way. And, you know, the, the early times when I was an undergrad interacting with Dan Gelbart, he was showing me what was wrong with my capstone project and, and drew, drawing a transfer function like I was learning in electrical engineering and suddenly this whole world opened up that like, you mean the things I make in the shop vibrate and that is actually mathematically modelable, modelable with this whole class that I just took. That's amazing. And this is the ultimate goal of the exciting thing about engineering. So anyway, we have a bunch of things in here. Uh, examples are mostly from Dan Gelbart and this guy, Alex Slocum, who is an MIT professor, or at least was 
Uh, there's a whole website there uh, we can get to later. Uh, you can go look at it. He's got a great deal of math. I've tried to simplify some of the important stuff he's talked about. Uh, and, and he's got more stuff. I just think this is the most important stuff I'm going to talk about. First, a little bit of design process. And again, this was aimed at these uh, engineering physics students. Take stock of the resources you have available. So you say you're in a, a, a you're, you know, you, this could actually be, I'm in a startup company. I've got some money. Uh, I'm in grad school. I need to make some apparatus. I'm in undergrad. We have a very short, like this was in physics two by three. We have literally five weeks to make a robot. Take stock of the resources you have available, materials, equipment, people, time, money. You know, do your enough background research. Uh, try to avoid, I don't care about it. You know, sometimes with undergrads, you guys need to reinvent the wheel. That's fine. But if you're doing something commercial, don't, don't reinvent the wheel. Don't pr solve problems that have already been solved. Do enough background research to know you're not wasting your time that way. Um, so then you got to brainstorm, right? Sketching ideas, thinking about the physics of things. And again, this is sort of mechanical oriented, but you can think about the same thing electronically. You can, you can make free body drives, you can check forces and so forth. In the case of an undergrad course, you know, you need to have your ideas, you need to talk to the instructors uh, naturally. Sometimes the instructors will be a bit, you know, unclear on what your genius vision is. Sometimes they'll try and talk you out of your, like, genius vision because it's absolutely ridiculous. Uh, but you have to have these interactions and kind of learn from them. them. And you want to you want to be a bit conservative in picking a tractable solution, you know, quite often, especially as you're inexperienced with this stuff. When you get better, you'll understand kind of what a tractable solution or, or what an intractable solution might look like. Um, in engineering, especially in MEC, they're quite big on teaching uh, sort of design formalism, more so than, certainly more so than engineering physics. And, and they talk about things like deterministic design. And I, for me, it boils down to when you do engineering, you should ideally never guess about any of your parameters or never just kind of put down some random value for some thickness of a material or something. There's always some, there's got to be some rationale for every design decision that gets made. If you, if you have no idea and you can't model it for whatever reason or the model, yeah, or you're very suspicious of the modeling, ideally do experiments. There's one thing I've learned from the biologists is that they're really better at doing experiments without, they're actually too good at doing experiments without hypotheses. But in physics, for example, they're too good at, at, at not thinking about uncontrollable variables. And I always say in physics, it's a, Great experimental physics is a great place where people learn to make extremely expensive instruments for measuring the temperature of the room because they never thought about the temperature of the lab being something that would influence their design. Ask me how I know this. There's also a matter of contingency planning and risk management and so forth. So you, what do you do when your favorite idea doesn't work? Uh, you know, when you're in a team, uh, you know, our egos wedded to certain concepts. Are people going to be flexible? Is that going to be a critical issue? Um, can you modularize design to make the, uh, you know, to, to sort of uh, isolate the risky concept and pivot to another concept, uh, which is definitely something that in a, in a robot design with a team or, or any kind of instrument design like that, there's, it's probably the case you can do that. Um, what, is, what, what would be drop dead dates for changing directions in, in this kind of design process? Uh, all of these things, I've seen specific examples where, where, where doing that properly would be valuable and doing it not, not doing it was catastrophic. Um, obviously, you've got to divide the, the, divide the system, systems into manageable modules. Interestingly, um, Dan Gilbert talked about this a lot early on when, when they had Creo, which did some very cool things I won't talk about. But this matter of how much of a project you download into the single person's brain, because at some point you download too much of the project, they become inefficient. But if you divide up the project too much and then they need to communicate with each other, it's also inefficient. So as a, as a leader of a project, it's very important to um, have this kind of sixth sense about what is the appropriate amount to divide up the project so that it gets done efficiently. Um, establish what are sort of intermediate testing points. Uh, again, this was particularly related to two by three, but this is always true. You know, what are your what are your uh, your points at which something has to work before you have to do some kind of crisis intervention? Uh, and that's where your milestones are important. And, and milestones, if you have a team breaking it up and giving people milestones, is really important. This leads to this tool that often gets laughed at but can be really critical, which is the Gantt chart, uh, which is where you put in your dependencies um, and you, uh, you, you have, you know, I have to design something, then I have to order it. And then if I look at these things and I look, the blue here is a, is a particular, well, there's a couple of individuals. There's Curtis, Robin, and Peter. And then all these things is waiting for things to get delivered and or lead times for machine shops. And when you put all these things in, you realize, oh, you know, we can reorder how we do things because this lead, this long lead time thing has to be done absolutely at the beginning. Otherwise, uh, we won't be able to get the entire project done because this lead time thing, you know, didn't get started right away. So Gantt charts are important for planning in that, in that way. So that's the, um, 
this is like all sort of at the administration level of design, but it's really important. Um, Yes, you have to learn how to estimate how long to estimate things. I will tell you that that my engineering physics friends, the, the most engineering physics thing is to be completely unrealistic about deadlines. And uh, particularly Jared Slobodin, the head engineer at Coastal Genomics, and I have agreed, even after all these years, and he started working for me in 2000 and, uh, 2007, I think, and he's you know now been at Coastal since 2013. And he and I are still totally unable to estimate things, but it's because we have so much enthusiasm. So I would I would add an addendum here is. In your in your back of your mind, you should be realistic about this. But in the front of your mind, you should never let terrible deadline or, or tight deadlines, you know, damp your enthusiasm. Um, other things I've seen, you know, CAD is great. It's really important. Uh, it is possible to get bogged down in design uh, because you kind of are enjoying doing the CAD, so your design takes too long to deliver. Uh, you need to actually build something at some point. Uh, that's the thing. I would nuance that that comment later, and I'll show you examples. Um, software takes. Here's an important point. If you're de developing a system that has mechanical and software components, the mechanical part takes way less time than the software. And particularly getting software to work, like that Barracuda story I told, we had Barracuda running it in the genome center in debug mode and did 10,000 samples because the guys who wrote the software were in the building. Um, when they went and formed Coastal Genomics, they took like a year and a half to rewrite the software so it was sufficiently reliable to actually send out in the field where a robot could be delivered to some other lab. Nobody was there to take care of it when they were trying to use it. So, uh, wow, software takes a long time and, and you got to leave time for that. Um, and of course, you have to, if you have a deadline of some sort, you have to leave time for testing. Okay, so onto the physics. Um, these are some fun principles that I think you can probably appreciate at a high level and not worry, don't get bogged down in the math. So this is a big thing that people always talk about when you get in design. You know, the simple solution is usually the best. And the classic example of Occam's razor is this idea that the Greeks uh, had this epicycles, the thing on the right, where they wanted everything to be perfect circles. So they, they described like planetary motion by, because planets actually move in ellipses. So they tried to describe, they tried to model it by using increasingly complicated collections of circles, one on top of the other. They should have, this is actually, they should have invented the Fourier transform at that point, but they didn't have the math. But this is the other thing, they didn't actually understand about ellipses because they didn't have the math and then Kepler came along and figured it out. The, the problem with this is exactly that, that this is Kepler's, this is Occam's misleading razor. And the reason is that the, the, the ellipses only make more sense or are more elegant or seem like they satisfy Occam's razor because you have more advanced skills. And so the danger with making a simple solution is you're, you think it's simple, simple, Simple is a value judgment, and, and it's based on your own biases and what you know. And so don't confuse the simple option with the lazy option or the option with your less experienced definition of simple. I've seen in the, in the 253 class, it was amazing the number of times that the stronger teams with a more complicated robot that did more complicated things that were maybe more failure prone were, got to run reliably and beat the pants off the simple robots. It, it was a common thing. Occam gets applied retrospectively, right? So we figure out what is the right solution and then we work backwards to figure out why it's actually the elegant solution. Drives me nuts. Um, and do instructors have perspective on relative complexity? Maybe, uh, but certainly somebody, uh, you know, you should, you, should, uh, you should think about this when you're arguing with somebody about what the simple solution is. Um, so general observations, it's really good to be good at classical physics. Uh, you know, mechanics, I know physics 270, I'm not sure what the course number is now, but this is like the main course in mechanics for inch phys. Um, Dan Gobart, know your fundamentals and know things like some constants of materials in your head because you can be designing while other people are looking stuff up in books. Professor Lauren Whitehead of UBC Physics Department, brilliant, brilliant person. He once told me very slowly, I like to do physics that I really understand. And he was able to go to a level of understanding of classical physics that I've never seen in anybody else. Uh, and, and, you know, it's, it's wild when you really understand these sort of basic principles. I have a feeling that everything you need to know is taught in high school, and you spend the rest of undergrad and grad school just, uh, just actually relearning it so you can really understand it. It's crazy. Okay, the real world. Um, big difference between the real world. Uh, there's actually, I think, now two, two things that are obviously different between the real world and the world of kind of physics 270 uh, and other physics problems that you would learn in early undergrad, no matter what kind of engineering you're in. One is friction, which is obviously more complicated in the real world than, than they certainly tell you in high school, because otherwise cars wouldn't need to have wider tires to have more grip. So friction, though, we can we reasonably understand there's a difference. But my, my bugbear here is actually, in the real world, everything is elastic. And elastic, elastic deformation is localized 
and it has hard to spread this stress around and therefore it leads to failure. And this is a really common principle in all kinds of structural design matters where elasticity localizes deformation leading to failure. This is attributable to a French um, theorist, the father of elasticity, according to Alex Slocum, named Jean-Claude Barré de Savenat. Uh, and so this is Savenat's principle we're gonna talk about. Um, and I am amazed, this guy is not well known, but, and, and there are different pictures of how you can, if you take Mac or Civil and you learn a lot about structures, there are different pictures of how this works. And I, I may be thinking about things in a particular way. And if I talk to my friend who's an executive with the Cowie Bridge Building Consultancy, he might have a different perspective. We argue about these things while we're trapezing on a catamaran. So it's a really good place to talk about free body diagrams. Uh, and he may have a different perspective, but, but in my picture, this is a very compelling way to think about things. And this is this, several characteristic dis distances away from an effect, the effect is minimized. And this is particularly to do with um, things like, like uh, deformable solid structures. I wish I had a piece of foam in my office, but I don't think I do, so never mind. So what we see on the right here is this um, kind of pair of pliers that's squeezing a piece of foam. And what you can see here is that, that, that say this thing has a diameter of D, once you get any further than one diameter away from where this deformation is occurring, really nothing is happening. And you, you know this intrinsically, when you take a piece of foam and you squeeze it with your fingers, you don't have to move very far away before there is very little deformation. Um, and and what, this, what this means is that, that that force is putting a great deal of stress in the point where the force is being applied, and that stress is not easily distributed. The interesting thing is if you, if you put that stress into tension, or depending on the material, or compression, then it's much easier for that force to be managed. But, but in many cases, it's when this force is in, in bending that it sort of causes all kinds of trouble. And so you can apply this in all kinds of, of, of mechanical situations. So this is an example of a, of a load on a wheel, and there's an axle, and then there's some kind of bearing. And here, so we have a shaft that's in white, and we have this kind of the solid stuff's in gray, and then the bearing is in green. In this one, the bearing, the two, the two bearings, this one and this one are close together. In this one, the bearings are far apart, which is better. You kind of know this, right? The, the, the lower one is better. This one's bad and this one's good. Why? Because the upper one, um, the, the bearings are close enough together that some kind of uh, twisting force occurs. And um, th this then leads to a bearing failure because you get very high loads that are, that are unnecessarily high because essentially you have this, this poorly managed torque where you can uh, spread the bearings apart, suddenly the uh, loads are much better managed. And if you get at least past three to five times the shaft diameter, and you're assuming your shaft is stiff enough here as well that it's, it's able to uh, resist bending, then you have much more well-behaved loads and you don't have these torques that will ruin the bearing. Bearings fail much more, are much more likely to fail from these kinds of overloading in a wrong direction than they are in, most, in many cases than from just straight loads that they're designed for. Another interesting one is in, in sliding systems. So um, this is the thing, like if I'm trying to fire a shell out of a gun, if the shell's too short, what happens? The shell starts twisting and it gets jammed. Um, the same can be said when you have a drawer, like in a, in a chest of drawers, drawers that are really wide and, and not very deep, they often get stuck. They, they twist sideways and get stuck. Uh, when you, you need, you need the, the thing that's sliding to be three or four times longer than the thing that it's sliding in uh, before it doesn't jam. So this thing is stable. This is Alex Slocum misspelling the word jam here. It should be J-A-M. But this long structure, that's gonna slide back and forth and be fine. This short one, it's gonna start twisting and it's gonna get stuck. And when it gets stuck, and if it's, say it's a, it's a shell and a gun and it gets stuck, that sounds like a dangerous situation. But anyway, it, it's gonna deform the metal inside and that's called galling. So we, we, uh, we see that in linear systems. Um, and again, it, the way to manage it is by spreading things out so that there are several diameters apart from each other and then your bearings will work properly and your sliding stuff will work, be fine. Uh, another one is when I bolt something to something else, and a good example of this is actually, uh, if you've ever been in a physics lab and seen a vacuum system, um, every time I apply force with a bolt or a screw, there's a screw, it under, so I, I started tightening it. This, this light blue thing here is a stress cone so this is showing where the deformation, where the force for the screw is actually bearing on a region that goes out in a triangle about 60 degrees from under the head of the screw. And so what that means is if I wanna have pretty even load on my circular flange, 
this could be a pressure vessel, right? A vacuum's like an inverted pressure vessel, but so imagine a, like an old steam train and they'd have rivets all the way around everything. If, if you don't have, so what we've got here is we've got lots of, of screws close to each other. And so those stress cones almost overlap. That means that, or, or ideally maybe they're even closer together. And so the blue parts even do overlap. That, that gives you much more even force over the flange plate than the one on the right here, where I've got a big distance between the stress cones. And then this region in the in between is actually not being pushed down. And so if I have something like an O-ring or a gasket under there, it can leak and bad things can happen or, or the, the whole thing will deform. So this is how you manage. So there's two ways to get this stress cone to spread out better. One is to use lots of bolts. The other way is to make the flange thicker, of course. And so when you look at a vacuum system in a physics lab or you look at a pressure vessel, you'll often see uh, both of those things apply. Thick flanges, lots of bolts. Um, another cool thing about stress uh, um, management, uh, the piano hinge and the lazy Susan. These are my, uh, these are two of my favorite low cost mechanical devices. Um, piano hinge is the hinge that used in various places in a piano, including here you can see on this Steinway, uh, the, uh, the hinge along the edge of, the, of this long, thin, uh, not very deep uh, cover for the keys. Um, what it's doing is by having a, very, a, a fairly simple structure that's, that's got lots and lots of fasteners, it's spreading the force of this rather heavy wooden structure on top. It's a, it's a small hinge compared to the size of the structure. It's spreading that force over a very large number of screws that are holding it together. And that means those screws can be individually quite small. When you have a door like the one in my office here, or any door you can see, you've got three hinges. They have to have much bigger screws. They have to be carefully assembled. If they start falling apart, like the house we, I rented when we were in grad school, when I was in grad school, uh, that you know, you're, you're, you're fighting all kinds of uh, failure because these you've got a lot of weight of the door hanging on a small number of screws and the forces are not well spread out. Lazy Susan bearing is, is used uh, if you go and get dim sum. I just put that in there because I hope people aren't hungry, but if, if, if you are, it's too late. Um, if you have, a, if you have a, a, a circular bearing like this, you can have a large number of balls and you spread the balls out over a large diameter. And if you go to Lee Valley Tools, the, 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 the um, Lazy Susan is the least expensive bearing with the most load that you can buy. You can get something that, that can easily hold like a thousand pounds and cost like 10 bucks. Uh, so th these are kind of neat things. All the forces are working for you, right? The whole thing's in compression. You've got lots, lots of area, so everything works well. It's pretty cool. All right, some other things. So this again goes back to the old physics two by three. This was John who used to run the whole program. He just got back from Japan. He arrives at the, at the, uh, the elevator at the airport with his rolling carry-on bag. Should he pull it or push it across the gap? And of course, everybody answers correctly that he should pull it across the gap. And if you think about what's actually happening there, you're, this is, again, the principle of self. So this is like a self-correcting system. So if you, if you pull, I guess B is the correct answer. If you pull, because you're going to the left, then the forces, when it hits the gap and then bounces into the elevator, um, the, the, you're, you're pulling on a force that has an upward component and you have a force that has a, a horizontal component. So the upward component is helping you get the thing over the gap and into the elevator. If you push on it, you're pushing down. When you hit the gap, of course, you're now forcing, you're, you're now worsening the situation. And again, in mechanical design, you see a lot of these situations. There's a neat one here. The, the, these are, this is a job interview question in some places, or has been. Um, what's the difference between a scale and a teeter-totter? Uh, and of course, if we were having an in-person lecture, I would you know, heckle you while people attempted to answer it. Um, merely that the scale, is, the scale has the pivot point above the balance. And the teeter-totter, at least old-fashioned, cool, dangerous teeter-totters in parks of my childhood, not the annoying spring ones that are too safe nowadays. Um, the teeter-totter, traditional teeter-totter, has the pivot point below the balance beam. And so again, this is a system that's intrinsically unstable and a system that's on the left that's intrinsically stable. Um, both of them have value depending on the situation. And, and, and basically you're employing this kind of you know, inherent design instability or design stability. So these are, these are ideas that you can use um, in, in many different, uh, different settings. It's, again, my goal this evening is to kind of make you aware that these concepts exist and, and you can spend a long time going forward thinking about where they're applicable. Um, 
sorry, we have to have a picture of Jacques Cousteau here, who's definitely a hero of the 20th century, um, TV scientist and all around great guy. Uh, one of the things he did, in addition to being the most famous marine science TV guy in history, is inventing the scuba diving regulator. This is an actual patent drawing. And again, here, uh, taking advantage of the idea of putting the regulator at your mouth. Why? Because you don't want to have a pressure differential between your mouth and this regulator that is changing the air pressure coming in from your higher pressure second to the first stage regulator of your diving apparatus. And so he had this idea that if you put, or he and colleagues had the idea that if you put the regulator at your mouth, you would never, when you're upside down or right way up or whatever orientation you are on the water, you would never have a pressure differential. So it's kind of like having a thing, this is like this, um, it's not the center of gravity, but it's kind of the, the similar idea that it's like doing something at the center of gravity and then it's good all the time. So what a hero. Um, and I, leading right into that then, what it, you know, these, this is like a center of action, a center of mass, center of stiffness, center of friction. Uh, where are forces happening? Uh, you know, this gets into hardcore mech and civil bridge building and whatnot. Um, thinking about working through centers of action again. Why? Avoiding unnecessary torque. And torque is a thing that you can't, that's, that's hard to manage. It, it, again, because of this of Sabinet's principle of stress not being easy to distribute, particularly in bending. So we can talk a little bit about shapes from coming from that too. Um, I've got a few slides here about materials. I won't get into this too much. Um, we want always to have materials that are light and stiff, uh, or we, we generally want always things to be as you know light and stiff, unless we're maybe building buildings that we just want them to be stiff and don't care how much they weigh. Um, there's definitely a huge range when you choose materials. I've got some more slides. I'll keep going on this right now. But there's a huge range. And so picking the right material is an important thing. Um, important principle here from the structural equations, really the one I want you to remember as you go forward in life, stiffness is proportional to the cube of the thickness. If I'm bending this pen, if I make the pen twice as thick, it's eight times stiffer. It has a big impact. Another related thing that's important is the length. Uh, the amount that this thing bends is, goes as the cube of the length for a given force. Um, again, if, I have, if I'm the designer and I have the ability to control how long my bending thing is, I, it makes a big difference in my design. Um, it follows from these equations as well that moving all of the mass to the outside is really important because of this concept of moment of inertia uh, in these structural equations. And we won't trouble ourselves with math right now except to remember that the more you can move things away from the neutral axis, the better. And so we like to make structures that are hollow ideally and thin. Uh, but not too thin, and then put the mask part of the outside. Um, closed structures are important because they, 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 they are like this, this hollow structure, but they also, with, with, with a structure like this, you need to prevent it from, in some cases, from twisting into a less stiff configuration. A good example of that is actually the I-beam, where when things fail, like for example, the Iron Workers Bridge collapsed in 1964, or whenever that was, um, if, if, if you kind of see the aftermath of it, um, you know, what happened, they got too far out. When it actually failed, the I-beams twisted from here into here uh, due to some uh, mistake in a calculation. Um, not that it wasn't right to build I-beams, because they're building I-beams there that are being prevented by being uh, twisted by the rest of the force of the bridge. But at some point, they got out to a point where they, they overwhelmed that resistance to twisting. Generally, we, we, we can build in resistance to twisting by making a more box-like structure. Um, I once talked to uh, Buck, Peter Buckland and Peter Taylor, what Order of Canada recipients were getting an award at UBC for engineering uh, excellence over a lifetime. And these guys, are their company is now called Cowie, but it's one of the most uh, sort of leading Canadian bridge building companies of all time. And I asked, I talked to them about this. And at the time, this was about probably about five years ago, and, and, and they're in their 80s. And the feelings of, and they were, they were, too, they were, probably in students when the, uh, or early in their careers, not involved in that bridge. But man, those feelings are still raw. When you see like big engineering failures, the, the, they echo forever. It's, uh, it's remarkable, the emotion of it still. Um, so, so anyway, uh, to conclude about this, you can kind of, or to summarize, you can kind of think, consider a beam of thickness T and length L. If the length is, is less than a third of the thickness, shear dominates. If a length is greater than the third of the thickness, or length is greater than three times the thickness, then bending dominates. So, uh, and then if, it, if bending dominates, you have to be careful because bending is, is, is a hard force to deal with. Um, a quick example here, or rather, what do we do then? Well, one thing in civil engineering you do is you add girders. Uh, so here's Ben, and he lifts, lifts this 14 pound carbon fiber truss from 
one of our, uh, our favorite suppliers, Dragonplate, who sells carbon fiber products. And you see this lovely truss structure, and there's little Ben. And here's 1,800 pounds of Dragonplate staff members uh, showing that this structure, even though it weighs 14 pounds, doesn't flex, which is a bit scary because that means the average weight of the Dragonplate staff is 200 pounds each, which is quite a bit. Um, but it's neat, and uh, that's, that's where girders, and you know, there's a lot of instruction about this that you take at school, but, but, but this, is, this is kind of what you're doing, is you're getting things uh, into shear uh, away from bending. Another thing that follows from that is the way we use composites. So you see here where, um, with carbon fiber that has foam core on the left, and then hollow tubes, which could be carbon or, or, or metal, is again, you're moving things away from the, the, the neutral axis. Um, to, uh, to kind of increase your thickness uh, and, and uh, not increase your weight. So, so both of these things kind of think about the, the air inside or the, or the foam in a, in, a, in a sandwich structure, carbon fiber sandwich, um, are basically just holding these two stiff material, these two stiff sheets away from each other, away from the neutral axis. Um, interestingly, aluminum, and this is a story from Dan Gelbart, and he tells, he says that Dornier, which is one of the aircraft manufacturers, so you go back and like Google Claude Dornier, unfortunately there's no good books about him in English that I'm aware of, but he apparently came up with the idea that, that, that aluminum, he was the last guy, by the way, who built a lot of planes out of steel using corrugations, which is kind of cool. But he made this point that aluminum is like, is also like foam, because weight for weight, it's low density, it, it, it therefore is thicker, so it moves material away from the neutral axis. So even though um, aluminum and steel have similar strength to weight ratios, aluminum ends up being easy to make stiff because it's a low density material. With steel, you have to resort to all kinds of tubular structures and wireframe structures in order to gain the advantages of steel, uh, steel strength versus its, its, its higher density. Uh, again, it, it takes time to think about this principle, but uh, I'll, I'll leave it there for now. Aluminum is like foam, just remember that. Um, final thing uh, I think about this area is just this concept of constraint and over constraint uh, and, and not over constraint. So this thing here is a kinematic mount. And a kinematic mount is a, a device which has the absolute minimum number of restrictions in its uh, degrees of freedom. So I need, this is too symmetrical. Let's find a non-symmetrical thing. Here's a box, a very expensive box of biology tubes. This thing has six degrees of freedom, right? Three translational degrees of freedom and three rotational degrees of freedom. When you constrain things, anybody who's used CAD software and you've used like a mating function, or say you've just taken one piece of wood and screwed it onto another one, what are you doing? You're actually restricting it with more than one degree of freedom. If I, if I, if I screw this thing down to a surface, I've not only restricted its mo movement, um, say in Z, but also in X and Y, or let's say I put one screw into it, it can still rotate, but it can't do these other motions. And so you can, you can constrain things by some number of degrees of freedom. Sometimes you want to minimally constrain them. Um, this, is, this is generally the true, true in optics. Uh, mostly we, we constrain things more than this, but I'll get to that. So, so this thing, what you've done here is you've got, a, you've got a flat surface, three balls on the upper one. The lower one, you've got a flat surface, a V groove, and a trihedral hole, trihedral hole. Uh, and if you think about it, this turns out to just perfectly restrict motion, but it only really has one restriction for every degree of freedom, unlike, say, screwing things together. The problem with screwing things together is you get this problem of over constraint. And a good example of this uh, is, for example, like particularly where you see this a lot is with shafts. So if I have a shaft, I can only constrain it in two points. If I have three, po if I have three things holding a shaft, Basically, the three things holding it have to be infinitely well aligned in order for it to be perfectly aligned. Um, in real life, what we do then is we, we connect, ideally, a shaft with two, couple, two, two bearings, and then in, like this green thing on the right, and then on the, um, oh, sorry, on the left, and then on the right here, if we see a connection between a motor and a shaft, we have some kind of flexible coupling that allows some uh, movement between these two shafts, either in, in, in X and Y or in angle or both. Um, you can see here, this is another Slocum picture, that in this motor above, uh, in the upper left, he's got, um, on the lower one, he's got a bracket on either end of the robot. That tends to constrain the shaft more than the one on the upper part, the upper uh, picture here, where he's got both brackets on one side, and that allows the motor to have some flex, at least in the up and down direction, which gives you a bit of uh, ability to, to accommodate alignment. Um, 
what that is actually doing then is what you're, what you're building in then is what we call controlled compliance. Uh, and so controlled compliance is when you can say, well, I've over constrained it and then I've, I've, I've sort of over constrained it and then I've allowed it to, to be not over constrained by allowing some movement in a controlled way in some part of the apparatus. A good example is when I have two rails like this, uh, this is like some XY gantry stage, I can allow some movement in one rail. So I have a fixed bearing on the left here, and then on the right, I have a little bit of flexure that allows this thing to flex back and forth. So a tiny bit of misalignment of these two shafts can be accommodated by this. Um, there's other ways to do this. Often when we run bearings together, for example, we put them in loose, we run them back and forth, we tighten them a bit, we put them in loose. This is like two bearings on one piece of metal that's, that's sliding back and forth on a rail. And you kind of, you don't allow them to be constrained in the wrong direction. You bring them into, you bring them into alignment. Uh, and even then though, when you have a, when you're going across a, a gap, you know, getting that alignment perfect is really hard. In, what you can do is you can build something using like brute force accuracy. And in fact, machine tools are made that way. And the reason is that they need to be stiff. Um, and machine, so machine tools, you have a heavy casting and then you machine it extremely carefully and you put two bearings that are in parallel and you just work on them until they're perfectly parallel and then you charge a great deal of money for the machine. But for systems that need to be somewhat cost effective, uh, when you don't need that level of rigidity, then you need to go to some kind of controlled compliance or minimal constraint. Um, a good example that people all know is, with this classic thing about con controlled compliance is when you go to a restaurant uh, with a square table, uh, the table is very, very often wobbly especially now in COVID, we have to eat outside. So we're on, the, on the, 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 the pavement and then the table is wobbly. Why is the table wobbly? Well, it has three legs, um, or sorry, it has four legs. The reason it has four legs and not three legs is because three legs is kind of unstable and the table will fall over. Um, four legs is much better, but the way restaurant tables are built to accommodate everyone's legs, they put a pedestal in the middle and then they have to have a rigid set of four legs at the bottom of the table. That rigidity actually prevents those four points from ever being properly in contact with the ground. Four points of contact is over constrained. Whereas three points of contact, like this three-legged table, it is tippier, but three points actually minimally constrains a table or any, any rigid body onto a surface. And it can be completely rigid, but the three points will always allow it to be stably stuck on the surface. That kitchen table on the right, that's okay. Um, why is it okay? because it has what's called controlled compliance. There's some flexibility in the table. These kind of tables we have at home are reasonably flexible, so they can, unless your table, unless your, your Quetzalano condo, or rather apartment rental from 1910 is extremely falling apart, your table is very likely to have enough flexibility that it doesn't sort of get wobbly. All right, back to prototypes here. We're, uh, we're getting there. Um, I, I compiled this a couple of years ago with some companies, the people I knew uh, that are going, have been generally all going forward and, and making great progress. Uh, and they're all sort of like little bit different, different categories. Well, maybe, maybe there's three categories here of different types of prototypes. Um, this is Karen, this woman, uh, Karen Lankarich's company, uh, Vodasave. It's basically handheld ultrasound for looking for uh, people underwater who might be drowned or maybe not drowned or, or, or whatever, but they're, uh, it's sort of marketed to lifeguards. So there they, they, uh, you know, they need a pretty finished consumer product type thing that, that looks pretty slick. And of course, uh, at some point you are gonna deliver early on something that actually does, actually works, uh, you know, once you get past the internal prototyping stage. The two instruments on the right are a couple of local companies, a Coastal I talked about and Precision Nanosystems. It's also been very successful. They can build instruments um, that are a little bit less uh, elegant looking, although Coastal did an amazing job on the recent light bench industrial design. Um, and then Arbutus Medical is another local company that's come out of UBC uh, MEC and the Engineers and Scrubs program. And so they're building a medical device like low-cost drill systems that, that are much less expensive than regular surgical drills. And so their, their systems primarily uh, don't have to look as cool as some of these other prototypes, but they have to be uh, obviously compliant with various me medical regulations as approximately like class two, you know, sterilizable devices. Uh, and so they, they have a high level of uh, product quality that they need to attain. Um, maybe maybe the Vodasafe one ultimately does as well, but uh, these are these are you know all slightly different constraints that that these prototypes end up having to uh, uh, sort of achieve. Um, I'm going to go through an example of quickly how we actually design something then kind of in detail. And I go through these slides fast. Uh, I used to talk about this mostly in the context of art. Isn't it cool to have water jet cutters and sheet metals in a machine shop? Because when I was 
uh, in undergrad and early grad school, we didn't have that. And then actually, we uh, actually, I guess we, we got this technology uh, at the university uh, starting at around 2007. So uh, it was a big deal at the time. But I think we can draw some general lessons about what we're actually doing in prototyping from these, the next few slides. So I'm going to build a thing. I'm going to build, I'm going to replace this thing with a new machine. Uh, don't ask me why, it's a long story. I need to hold these uh, plates that look actually quite similar to this, but I need to stack three of them on top of each other and hold them in a box. So I make a sketch and I think, how am I going to do it out of sheet metal? And I sketch and I know what I'm kind of how to design things. So I, I, I get close to it, but I don't get as close as when I go to CAD. So CAD nowadays, super important stage. It's really mechanical simulation. You can, you, I said earlier, don't rely too much on CAD. Don't take too much time, but you do have to, if you're, if you're efficient at CAD and somebody in a, in a group that does this kind of work has to be efficient at CAD, you design it and then you see what it really is like. And if you get reasonably experienced, you can one shot your design. You can get the right thing almost every time you get exactly what you wanted from the CAD design first time because you know what you're doing. We isolate one part. This is very bad sheet metal. Uh, when, I just, when I did these slides, it was a long time ago and, and these were, uh, this is not quite how you should do this. I won't go into why. Uh, it has to do with the bending is not quite uh, proper, but anyway. Um, okay, so you have a 3D model of a part. Okay, now in the machine shop nowadays, you actually take this part and if it was, say this was actually a CNC machine part, you can send that model to the shop. At the same time, you also need to send a, a, a drawing. This drawing doesn't really have any dimensions. It's got one or two dimensions. Um, drawings are still important, even though you send, a, you send a model, but the drawings have all the details of what you're actually building. Like, what are to particularly tolerances, what is the, the, the possibility of variability from the design? Like, like what, what tolerances are critical, what tolerances are not critical? Um, specific instructions about threading, for example, again, Often threads, screw threads, have to meet certain standards of, of, of tolerance and so forth. Um, in this case, we then go to some, we, we actually go from this two-dimensional model into a, a CAD model in the uh, uh, WaterJet software. And so this is uh, OMAX WaterJet. Again, there's one in MEX students can use, unfortunately, in COVID time, of course, we're not doing that. Uh, there's one in, uh, uh, EngFizz has one, and there's various others around. Chemical Biological Engineering has one. I don't know if students get to use it. Um, this is the part, and we go to the water jet cutter. We're gonna take uh, 18 gauge material here, which is about one and a quarter millimeters. We're gonna cut these parts out. We're gonna do a little deburring. You can see the sheet I have that we cut it out of. That goes back in storage. And then we have a, a bending and spot welding. Um, and so we can form this part in, and we can form the other parts. And then we have this, uh, I'm not sure why this is all wet, but anyway, I think I must have cooled it down after spot welding. We've put together this part. It works, it's a bit ugly looking, um, and so actually, in order to make it look better, we sandblast it and then we powder coat it. Um, unfortunately, this is not something I think that it used to be implemented in MEC, but they, they don't have it implemented right now to, to do, that is to do in-house powder coating. This is our actual powder coating booth currently in the shop. Um, but in the end, you see, you go from this unattractive prototype to this much more serious looking prototype. Um, so I know probably for all of you, this, this is all a bit out of context in terms of these, uh, uh, the usefulness of knowing the details of these things, although as you go into late undergrad and do projects, you'll, you'll get there. For me, this was a major, this, this, this two-dimensional water jet or laser cutting, because uh, they basically work in a similar way. Water jets are just more versatile at different types of material. Uh, lasers, lasers are more efficient at sheet metal, actually. Um, but these, the, these, these are very revolutionary machines because they give you the option to work with sheet metal. Um, here is me in 1991 in undergrad machining parts on a manual Bridgeport milling machine. And I got really locked into this idea of I would use aluminum for everything and everything was like a problem that could be solved with pieces of aluminum. And so on the left here, at some point, while I was actually here at the Genome Center, I designed this holder for these uh, things that needed to be washed in the dishwasher. This is some gel electrophoresis thing. Um, the holder, as you can see, is made out of aluminum. Well, aluminum is like the single worst thing you can put in a dishwasher because dishwashing detergent has extremely high pH. And so would, it, would you believe that that this frame, so this part and this frame part and this part here, were anodized black. And by the time this photo was taken, the anodizing had been completely worn off. The other thing was these parts are really expensive to make because they have their long and they have holes in the end, which is really hard to set up in a machine. Somewhere along the line, after this was made, I first met Dan Gelbart and visited his shop, which is literally in the basement of his house in Point Grey, and talked about water jetting and laser cutting and stuff and realized I could do it this way on the right. And this is uh, laser cut from 20 gauge sheet. It's a much better system. You can see it's double height. 
uh, probably cost less than a quarter of the amount that the one on the left cost. Uh, and so this was a huge deal at the time for me. Um, fortunately, now you guys uh, can learn to do either of these things and, and pick the right solution. And that also includes 3D printing. So a lot of this prototyping is picking the right solution. Um, a few things that stem though, I'll just talk about these because they're fun. Uh, when you have the ability to do, to do uh, sheet metal forming type work, you can pick whether you want like to have a system on the left where you've got uh, a reasonably accurate kind of square uh, that's more rigid, or you can make this much faster on the right is one piece of steel that's just bent. This was a, this was a take up reel for an old film camera. This is actually for an art project, but we designed both of these. And I think I ended up um, doing the one on the right. Actually, no, I did the one on the left for some reason at the time, but in retrospect, the one on the right is the way to go uh, for this particular application where it's one part, one bend, done. This other part, you've got some screws in there, you've got to make some threaded holes and it's more complicated. Um, other things you can do with, with water jetting, and again, I, I, I promote this because you have, some of you will have access to this equipment, is you can think about some complicated structure. Uh, this is something off of that Barracuda robot I talked about, uh, which had some holders that are made out of these parts up here on the, the left. All of these parts are water jet. So you see here, this one is what you know these parts are water jetted from kind of this direction uh these ones are water jetted from this direction there's a little there's a little uh end cap here uh and, and all these parts are made separately and then they're screwed together and this this could be a more efficient way than elaborate machining of the single parts so you can think about that nowadays maybe some of these parts i would have printed actually but uh certainly at the time the, the parts came out really nice and when you make them out of aluminum they last forever of course um a thing that I'm not talking about here for reasons of time, of course, is, is uh, really fastening things together. And I, I brought this one up because I have, uh, she might actually be on this call, I'm not sure, but Leah uh, Hartwell is a um, undergrad uh, working on this Bioform Innovations, uh, which is a, a, an early stage commercial enterprise. I think it's at, within E at UBC somewhere. And they're figuring out a product to basically turn polymer, like uh, uh, wood product polymers into thin films, get them to polymerize into thin films, think like saran wrap type stuff, by, flow, by allowing them to polymerize while they're flowing between two other sheets of water. So you're basically forming up a layers of flowing water into a structure. And so inside this box, there's this kind of structure of multiple different sources of water all forming into big flat sheets and then merging together. And I was first brought to this by a, uh, an ent entrepreneur in residence at, e at UBC that we know that called me when he sees these problems. And so I met the principal people on this, Leah and, and this postdoc, Jordan. And, the, and Leah designed this thing and she didn't have a single screw holding it together. So I was like, okay, Leah, we're gonna, and, and of course also it's water. So as soon as you like, somehow you gotta screw it together and also it has to not leak. So you need, you need screws and you need O-rings. So we spent a lot of time, um, uh, then we spent a lot of time on this thing in the last few weeks uh, figuring out where to put the screws and where to put the O-rings. Uh, and I don't want to go into the details about this, and unfortunately I can't really talk, I love to talk about fasteners and fasting things together and how that implacts your design for easy, ease of manufacturing. But suffice it to know it's important, and if you really get to the point where you have problems in this area, you can find me uh, through Innovation Onboard and maybe I can uh, help you. Because uh, it does, it does, it is kind of the, getting from the shape of the thing, this case is a fluid dynamics problem, right? So the fluid dynamics drives the shape. So we get to the shape of the thing. Then we need to say like, well, how do we actually subdivide that into different pieces? And how do we fasten those pieces together? So uh, without saying more about it, let's say that's a very important part of these processes. This, by the way, also is an interesting thing that it's kind of like an, a, an apparatus you'd have as a grad student. Like it's my big experimental apparatus for my thesis. But at the same time, it's a prototype for a thing that might be a spinoff company or that they're sort of doing commercial evaluations of. And so both of those things require it to look reasonably good and work really well. And also, because it's a sort of experimental apparatus, you need to be able to take it apart and change some of the parts internally and then do it again and run it. So it needs to be really robust uh, to being sort of like disassembled and reassembled and still working. Uh, so it's an interesting area between like sort of a finished prototype and an experimental apparatus uh, where it's, it's got to look good but also be you know, useful for experiments. Um, other things you do with two-dimensional uh, things, I just probably this slides around of order, but uh, you can make, again, flexures. That's where you make a skinny little thing, or this is like a little st uh, steel sheet. 
spot welded together and you make things that are flexible. And then, for example, these are electronic mounting boards that they, they kind of mount an electronic board on a, on a box here. And that was a really good system for robots. Here's a mounting a sensor for a 3D imaging system used in uh, uh, mech mechanical engineering and in, in, in orthopedic research, things like that. So there's lots of lots more options of, of that sort. And you can make really complicated shapes. There's a couple of examples of, again, medical devices or robots that you make these shapes that are really complicated in two dimensions. Of course, you can do this with 3D printing and make really complicated shapes as well. Let's talk about 3D printing. How are we doing? We got 20 minutes left of my 90 minutes. Um, let's talk about 3D printing. I think 3D printing is, you know, has, a, has had a huge amount of hype in the last few years. And the hype maybe is dying down a bit now because like all hype, if it doesn't deliver, then it, it has to be, you know, what it really is. And what it really is, in my view, is that it's a very useful tool, but it is somewhat limited um, in where it's super valuable. What we find is it, um, you still mostly can build lots of prototypes out of kind of more conventional methods for reasons of material, for reasons of scale, uh, for reasons of actually, you know, if, if I'm building like particularly any of the robotic stuff I do is like, uh, they're not really complicated shapes. They can be made in two dimensions or I'm buying off the shelf automation components. This is also very true of electronics. I'm buying off the shelf components. I'm putting them together. Doesn't really require uh, anything beyond the, the 2D thing, but then there'll be like one or two parts. Like in this case, is a robot for holding this, this glass capillary uh, for some protein research thing. And I got one 3D printed part as a special holder for this particular valve. Uh, and so I have one 3D printed part and everything else in this particular robot is, um, is uh, made with water jet cutter or it's commercial apparatus. Um, other good applications for 3D printing, however, are for kind of insulated structures, like anytime you're managing air, that's also true of things like, you know, you always see examples of blades like fan blades or intake manifolds or things where you have thin wall structures because you're basically managing the flow of air. They don't have to be intrinsically strong necessarily. It's kind of painful when they have to withstand high heat and then you're back to using metal. But uh, 3D printing is certainly very nice when you can manage airflow in a way that uh, isn't, um, you know, it doesn't require incredibly high performance. Uh, obviously, you know, they're trying to use it for jet engines and stuff. I think, I think the intrinsic smoothness of metal 3D printing may be a limitation. One thing that's fantastic is uh, 3D printing anatomy. But again, this is kind of under the heading of 3D printing models. But we have various projects of you know, good projects, 3D printing uh, example anatomies for people to do surgical planning. I continue to print uh, an, uh, uh, skulls, particularly for a doctor at Chong's Hospital, uh, uh, Dr. Kormosh, uh, of, of He gets these ca cases that are people with significant um, malformations, I guess you'd say. Uh, typically jaws that are overdeveloped or underdeveloped or, or, or partially developed with missing pieces like the one you see in this uh, on the left here. And then they wait until the child has basically reached adulthood and they've stopped growing and then they can do some major corrective surgery. So we've been printing some of these skulls out every few months. We print one out uh, and they can take that and do planning. They can talk to the family about what they're doing and so forth. So that's kind of a neat thing. Um, again, any complicated shape. So this is a uh, Dr. Aiden Prisman at VGH with bone guide cutting, they're, they're reconstructing jaw bones. Uh, they actually are printing these saw guides, 3D printing the saw guide. They, they harvest your fibula and then turn it into a mandible. Um, and so there's some digital stuff going on upstream that makes them figure out how to cut the bone and then they 3D print the saw guide. So these are cool applications. Um, we've got other, I, I'm, I'm kind of, these are kind of too many examples. This is for a variable, like realizing that you can control the density of the inside of a structure. Uh, like a like a smart sponge, you might call it. So doing doing uh, doing uh, positron emission tomography imaging by by changing the density. I have a collaboration with some uh, medical physics people about this that's been uh, going on for a while. It's quite interesting. Um, yet another thing that's been heavily slowed down by COVID, I should say. Um, so to conclude about three D printing, it really um, it's really good for the right application. The lack of the right materials and and, and surface finishes can be a real limitation. Uh, or you other other things like internal voids and so forth, this, it, it causes you trouble. It, it also is really better when you're not printing overly large volumes because it scales with the, you know, volume scales with the cube of the length, cost scales with the cube of the length in a way that when I'm getting um, sheet materials, for example, I can get very large sheets of things much more cheaply uh, if I can do something in two dimensions. Uh, so, so um, and I guess CNC machining is also somewhat cost scales with volume. Uh, whereas, you know, in, in laser cuttings, cost scales with area. Uh, so, so you have to think about that. Um, I would say generally, like, what you, in a, in, when you're in a place that has, pro that can do prototyping, or you're 
setting up to do prototyping, you need to access all of these different types of methods, 2D, 3D machining, and 3D printing, and then you can get what you need done. Um, and then, of course, machining is great. I love the finish. I, you know, there's a reason why iPhones are CNC machined aluminum cases, because it looks really cool. The problem is, you know, it's hard to program a single part. We used to do things manually. You can still do things manually. It's very fine. But it's much nicer to do things with CNC machining. But CNC machining requires going through this computer aided manufacturing step. That's generally something that's quite specialized knowledge that students generally do not have access to. Um, easily and so except in very small number of labs um, and so that's a place where you need a good partnership with your uh, CNC machine shop and be able to communicate with them well to figure out what needs to be done the interesting thing about CNC machining is that you're you're very affected by the shape of the tool so it's a different method of machining where you're you're sort of adding the pathway of the tool and the shape of the tool to create the final shape and so it's an entire cam is an entire industry um, in a sense 3d printing and, and, and laser cutting and water jetting have the same uh, uh, factors, but but those tools are much simpler. The, there's only one tool. There's no other diameter of tool or shape of tool. There's only one cutter, or in the case of 3D printer, there's only one method of adding material. So that the the planning of the construction method becomes much more straightforward. Some rules, just randomly, if if this is in top of mind for anybody right now, uh, you 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 can, for example, if you're going to make deep pockets, you want to have broad radii on the sides and narrow radii at the bottom. It's kind of a neat technique. Um, try not to do three-dimensional machining. It's extremely expensive unless you absolutely have to, like making injection molds. Um, you want to be able to always, you always want to be thinking about how to hold the part. If it's easier to hold the part with parallel faces, how do you do that? How do you do multiple operations? Uh, I don't want to get too far into this because what I actually want to do is I want to stress this slide, this, this line I added up at the top here, which is the first rule of CNC machining develop a strong and respectful relationship with your CNC programmer operators. So whatever machine shop you're working with, talk to them, get feedback, uh, get, take their suggestions. You know, you can talk to different people and get different ideas. Once you've decided what to do, this is actually generally a very important principle for you as engineers. Once you've decided how, to, how this should go, you should take their advice and turn around and actually insist that that's what we're gonna do. I mean, don't insist in a rude way, but take responsibility for acting on the advice that you're given. So you've said to the machinist, okay, you think this is the best way to do it. I'm gonna design the part accordingly, and then I'm gonna come back and ask you to do that. And the reason I say that is that one of the things you need to know as an engineer is it's important to take responsibility for the design because you're not leaving responsibility for decision-making with the shop whose job it is not to make that decision. So you need to be making the decisions about the design. Even if somebody else makes a suggestion, you're responsible for the design. So, so you need to take responsibility for that. I see this all the time in the, with the medical physicists at the cancer agency, and I love them all, bless them. But they kind of vaguely suggest things to the machine shop. Oh, how far apart do these little BBs need to be in this phantom for x-ray imaging? Oh, I don't know, 10 millimeters, 20 millimeters. I'm like, I just want to slap them at that point because it's like, pick a number based on some physics rationale and tell the machine shop, the machine shop job is not to do medical physics. So anyway, as engineers, you know, physicists are physicists, engineers are engineers. So I'm telling you, you must, as engineers, think about this, taking responsibility for design decisions because that is our job. Anyway, briefly, materials. Uh, there are thousands of materials. Don't let this confuse you. I like to go to events like Innovation Onboards, Entrepreneur Night, and then talk to, find people who are materials engineers and then quiz them on basic materials and discover they know all about the thousands of materials, but they don't know about the basic materials. Um, all right. Uh, a lot of times when you're prototyping things and you're doing it yourself in a machine shop, you're using aluminum. Uh, these are really like, I'm going to tell you a few specific materials that you need to know about and think about. Um, vast majority of time when you're making things, anything in research, you're using 6061 T6. It's strong. It machines. It welds. It's nice. You can heat treat it and use it in aircraft or bicycles. Uh, or you don't have to, it's not as strong. Um, if you're doing all welding and forming, like if you're bending, which 6061, when it's the high, high temper, uh, doesn't, it tends to break. If it's T6, it breaks when you try to bend it a lot. So you can use 5052. What is made out of 5052? All boats under 50 feet that are work boats pretty much are aluminum nowadays, as you'll see uh, if you go to look at a fish dock. Um, there's also 7075, which is super strong. Uh, it's used in airplanes some, uh, and various uh, you know, small applications. It's not really weldable. Anytime I see, and I occasionally do see engineers um, 
using 7075 when they don't need to, and then I heckle them mercilessly. Um, interestingly, you can also, uh, you can bend and form, as I said, 5052. You can actually weld it to 6061, and the, the resulting structure is not too bad. Uh, how do I know this? Because I recently worked on this thing called the Electrum, which is this thing in the lower right. And if you don't believe me that this is real, check it out. Yes, that's right. The world's most eccentric electric vehicle. I'm not responsible for the, um, the uh, blue parts of this thing, but that chassis underneath I designed in CAD, and it was welded out of 5052 bent parts and 6061 tubing. Uh, it worked perfectly, and this is my friend Fabricio Cross in Victoria, and there is his Electrum. Would you like to buy one? I can connect you with him. Uh, in steels, we have uh, really in stainless, you have 304 all the time that you'll encounter generally. And when you, it's great for water jetting and laser cutting and so forth. Um, 316 is a surgically implantable stainless. There's a couple of these 174s and 177s. They're really high performance materials. Uh, they're super good for lots of applications. They're not implantable. And then you can, the, there's 301, which is kind of a spring material. Um, and then in the ferrous metals, there's, there's mild steel. Uh, which is cold or hot rolled, and I'm not going to go into too much detail. All that sheet material that we like cut out in that earlier example, that's, that's cold rolled. When thicker cold rolled can be under stress, and, and actually this, this pipe in this little photo here uh, is, is cold rolled, and it's under a lot of stress. You can see here for, for some project for a friend, I water jetted a chunk out of the pipe, and it bent. So there's interesting considerations with steel, um, but that's okay. You don't normally do this. That was a strange project. Uh, in terms of higher performance ferrous materials, People often talk about alloy steels. The main ones are 4130, which is what bicycles are made out of when they're made out of steel, and then 4140, uh, which, which is, a, these are great steels. And then there's a commonly, easily uh, uh, usable tool steel, which can get really hard, like for knives, called A2. Uh, and, and again, so you can, you, you don't need to know about thousands of materials. Thousands of materials exist because when you're manufacturing stuff at truly large scale, you need to be saving a lot of, at some point, the cost of production of a thing, even like an automobile, the cost of production is a huge fraction of it is the cost of materials because they're so efficient at the production process. So there they can get small gains from changing alloys. In our case, what, with our prototyping, um, the, the, the material is almost always a small part of the total cost. And so using a really good material that's not the perfect material is perfectly acceptable in our case. So that's why we don't need to worry about too many materials. Um, for plastics, same thing. In prototyping, we use a ton of Delrin, uh, acetyl copolymer. It's commercially known as Delrin. Um, it's really good. It's not chemically so good. Uh, it machines absolutely beautifully. For some chemical applications, high density polyethylene is good. Also, if you generally just need a bunch of plastic for some physical shape, like filling up space or whatever, um, polyethylene is more recyclable. Delrin's not really recyclable. So I like polyethylene if I know that eventually it's going to get recycled. Um, acrylic is a great laboratory material. It's quite brittle. Uh, that's his main drawback. It can crack. It cracks when you expose it to alcohol. Um, but it's super clear. Doesn't autofluoresce. Good for experimental flow cells and stuff. Uh, polycarbonate much stronger. Scratches easily. Um, and then and then PVC and ABS. You know pipes, various other things. Nylon terrible for machining. Good for vacuums. Uh, these are about these are the majority of the materials. There's a couple high performance plastics, Peak and and Kynar and stuff. But uh, these are the main ones. Some prototyping resources. Uh, again, this is recorded, so hopefully you can uh, get these later. I think um, generally just the engineering physics two by three project lab still has a bunch of my stuff in it and other things, and I think it's still pretty good. And that, my friends, at uh, one hour and I would say uh, 15 minutes is that. Thank you very much for sticking around.